And welcome to the ISD, ISD 191 Burnsville Egan Savage School Board meeting. Let's call um, tonight's meeting to order. The date is October 8th, 2020, and the time is 6.30. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming um, everyone who's joining us from home. And just a reminder that our next meeting, October 22nd, uh, will be our hybrid meeting in which both staff and board members will be attending in person and virtually. Um, with that, Director Hallwiger, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll start by uh, approving tonight's agenda. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Moved by Director Schott. Second? Second. Seconded by Director Hume. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Kenny, would you please call the roll? Alt. Aye. Chester. Aye. Courier. Aye. Holwiger. Aye. Hume. Aye. Miller. Aye. Schatz. Aye. And the motion carries. Uh, we will start uh, tonight's meeting. Um, with our information section, uh, we will be receiving an update about District 191's efforts to implement COVID-19 related educational and public health guidance issued by the MDE and the MDH respectively. And we will start with Dr. Battle. Welcome Dr. Battle. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Alt and directors of the board. Tonight, I want to first acknowledge staff for a Express that they appreciate the staff or allow them to ease into the new routines, the hybrid model, as well as virtual academy. As educators, we are accustomed to dealing with ambiguity, but COVID-19 has taken ambiguity to a whole new uncharted level. So I want to thank the staff for the work to implement the six first in-person days. So we not only had one first day in the school, but six. And following my report, Amina Oftedal and Stephanie White will present on learning and teaching and support services in hybrid and in the virtual academy. With that, I start first with health and safety with the latest county updates from Dakota and Scott. These numbers present the period 9-12 through 9-26. Dakota County reported 20.23 per 100,000 residents of confirmed cases, an increase from 16.57, and Scott County reported 24.83 up from 19.25. We are using the confirmed Glad to be back. I think everyone's here, Chair Alt. I think so. So that was short-lived just as we had a Schoology outage this Wednesday during our flex day that was quickly uh, uh, corrected. It was a global outage. So glad to be back. Um, glad everyone is able to adjust to these tech technology glitches. 
So I was reporting on the county numbers. Um, I finished that report and now I'm going to move on to uh, the mandated advisory committee we have, the COVID-19 advisory committee as mandated through our state's guidance. Um, the MDE safe schools guidance stipulates that a school district may choose to be more restrictive than what is recommended by the parameters set forth in the safe learning plan. And one of the, uh, the main purpose for the COVID-19-191 advisory committee is to review data and other factors and advise the superintendent on the need to dial back or become more restrictive in our chosen learning model. The committee members include parents, staff, bargaining unit leaders, and board Just representatives. Just kick us out or was? The committee has suggested a criteria in addition to the county confirmed cases that could be used to recommend a change in our learning model. These include trend data of decreased confirmed cases. Both Scott and Dakota County Public Health share that cases fluctuate, so we would want more than a few weeks of decrease. They also asked us to consider staffing, the 5% or lower threshold in the county of confirmed cases. Secondary scheduling, it's very difficult within a matter of days to change the secondary schedules for grade six through 12. They also asked me to consider cost, time and resources to transition. And they took a system wide view and recommended that we look at the impact on other systems in our organization, such as busing, scheduling, and food service. Assistant Superintendent Brian Gershitz and I shared additional criteria we might consider, and we also placed all the uh, criteria into categories of staffing, academic slash student, and health and safety. Also, the COVID-19 leadership team has also provided input. Now to move on to the area of academic and guidance for school planning. Teachers for the 612 Pathways courses have revamped them and identified software that supports pathways and can be used with Chromebooks. As many of these courses do provide hands-on experiences, there was a need for them to revamp the courses um, and to find some software that could um, provide more hands-on for our students. At the end of September, there were 1,800 contingency plans for students receiving specialized services as an addition to their individual education plans. 800 were completed for in-person students, K-12, and 500 for virtual academy students. These plans were developed to ensure that we can still meet students' individual needs in a virtual environment. Student and family support. The communication plan is to continue educating our students, families, and staff on the health and safety practices after each break in um, our calendar. So as you know, next week, we will have uh, two days of non-instruction due to the State Teachers Union, Education Minnesota. So using social media and our websites, the communication department We'll continue to push out videos, instructional posters, and procedures on mask wearing, social distancing, hand washing, and staying home when you are feeling ill. Also, building leaders will send out parallel pieces of information through newsletters, emails, and their building social media accounts. An update on technology. Since the beginning of the school year, we have handed out 6,000 learning devices. The tech team is working on improvements such as speeding up access for new students, exploring an unlimited plan for hotspots and training to support substitutes. Moving on to activities, the Minnesota State High School League Board voted to permit winter sports. Winter sports are scheduled to begin from one to five weeks later than usual to minimize overlap with the fall sports season. There will also be a 30% reduction in games and matches, allowing for, two, uh, allowing for two per week. Minnesota State High School League also decided that fall sports will conclude with section championships. 
no decision was made on the winter sports postseason. Our athletic director, Guillaume Peck, continues to meet with conference leaders to discuss the impact for our students, coaches, and spectators. Our marching band also worked with the Burnsville High School leadership team and determined they would not be playing at the football games. The advisor cited several factors included, but not limited to cold weather, limitation of spectators, limited performance time, and ability to practice. We will continue to work with the team at Burns for High School, to determine our next steps to provide opportunities for students and to ensure safe participation for our students, coaches, and uh, families. Today, just earlier today, uh, Minnesota Department of Education, MDH, and Minnesota State High School League updated their guidance for fall sports, particularly um, regarding spectators. So since this is new information, staff will be reviewing to determine any adjustments. Moving on to enrollment, um, as of October 5th, K-12 enrollment is 7,631 and VPK through 12, which is the voluntary pre-K through 12 is 7,905. There's a full report um, that will be posted after my report, after the board meeting um, with more enrollment data. Moving on to operations. Previously, I mentioned that we had six first days um, and so bus drivers and students managed it well. So kudos to Smitty and Sons, um, their drivers, the whole support team at Smitty and Son, as well as students following the safety protocols. Um, and so I really want to thank everyone for that uh, smooth transition um, in the fall. Um, operations is working on transportation plans for an in-person ACT administration. So that's one example of some tailored um, transportation that they are providing. And so now I'll turn it over to Amina Afdal and Stephanie White. <clears throat> Sharon Alt. Uh, members of the board, Superintendent Battle. Uh, um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to share with you some of the uh, um, some of the uh, uh, things that we have in place that will um, support the learning environments for all students. Um, I would like to share my screen if that is possible. Um, tonight, uh, uh, Director uh, Stephanie White and I will be sharing uh, some information from the uh, CSIS Department, Systems Improvement and Student Achievement, and the Special Education Department. Uh, one of the things to keep into in mind with the CESA department moving forward is that um, as we began the year, our intention was to provide instructional models that responded to the information and feedback that we gathered from students, parents, and staff last spring and over the summer. The distance learning 2.0 model included a minimum of 120 minutes of live student teacher interaction each day. This powerful engagement tool, as well as teachers setting specific schedules, has set us apart from our neighboring districts and provide a school environment in each student's location beyond the school's brick and mortar. In some middle schools and high school classroom, it even includes students at home joining their peers in class virtually. This has required even more technology solutions for, connect for connectivity and devices. Uh, keep in mind that we are maintaining three instructional models simultaneously, and this requires innovation to deliver uh, differentiated instruction and support for students. Utilizing our academic uh, support teachers as elementary pod instructors makes what I need or win time a very different experience this year. CESA coordinator Janet Golden and multilingual coordinator Maria Arago, collaborating with special ed supervisor Amy Piotrowski, are working with each building principal to build a workable support and enrichment structure that can serve in-person, 
distance learning and virtual academy students beyond core instruction. This includes fulfilling the educational service plans for students with disabilities and multilingual students learning English. Technology and CESA staff have collaborated to create common expectations for organization and navigation in Seesaw and Schoology to assist students and parents as they access the learning platforms. Our K-5 curriculum coordinator, Bethany Van Oswell, has been leading teams of teachers to create a guide and support for the hybrid distance learning instructional model. This includes a step-by-step -step guide for elementary teachers to develop the face-to-face -face and distance learning days. Curriculum pacing and lessons are collaboratively written and available to all teachers, including those in virtual academy. Activities have been identified for best delivery method, face-to-face, -face, video conference, and independent practice. Our digital learning specialist, prior to moving into uh, elementary pods, created a technology skill scope and sequence with lessons for each grade band. The intention being to build student capacity and skills to be more effective for their remote learning time. Also, classroom assessments are a valuable tool to measure student progress toward content standard mastery, and students will continue to complete their classroom assessments for progress reporting, including uh, using district report cards in addition to conferences with parents. District benchmarking assessments are also currently underway using in-person whenever possible and remote administration when necessary. Last week, we, um, the middle school uh, administered 2,700 uh, assessments through FastBridge online services um, with little or no um, support from technology, allowing tech, the tech support folks to continue to work in the areas of greatest need responding to students and teachers. This required the support of the assistant principals and deans in the building, and they were outstanding. In the secondary buildings, um, building leadership teams, building principals, and 612 curriculum coordinator Franny Becker have developed schedules and systems that support hybrid learning and distance learning. The key to putting together the schedules was ensuring that regardless of whatever choice of model made by the students, the students would have equitable access to courses. Middle school was able to transition to their block schedule as part of the middle school redesign. It has been adjusted to fit the health and safety requirements, um, but rather than alternating days for science and social studies, they alternate semesters, one semester for science and one semester Middle school electives and exploratories are being delivered remotely for both hybrid and virtual academy. Um, high school is incorporating more classroom live streaming to ensure that students have access to single section courses. And virtual academy teachers are part of all the content area meetings and planning. Currently, English language arts is aligning the, aligning the grade nine and 10 courses with the 11, 12 scope and sequence for writing and literature reflecting multiple perspectives in literature with more inclusive lists of authors and texts. Using the best practices identified in the blended learning cohorts provided by director, tech director Rachel Gorton, teachers are being asked to use this lesson design framework, which incorporates digital tools into planning and practice and utilizing over 25 district vetted digital tools that are either free or have been purchased the digital lesson planning guide offers multiple options for teachers and students. The expectations for high quality lessons are that they engage the student, assume high expectations for all students, and build capacity for digital independence. Um, the CESA team is also very focused on providing the professional development and support for teachers in all three of the models. There was a extended workshop week and new teacher onboarding Actually, last week we onboarded four additional uh, elementary teachers, so it is continues to be ongoing as we hire. There is instructional support for elementary hybrid teachers, new or returning to the classroom. There is tech ongoing technology training and support for video conferencing. Teams developing elementary literacy, math, and technology lessons. And professional development on teaching in the block or extended time and AVID school-wide. 
Along with supporting hybrid distance learning, the regular work of curriculum continues, continues simultaneously. We continue to work toward district equity and anti-racism work through CPSS. K-5 math curriculum review and implementation continues. The 612 Next Generation Science Standards Implementation continues. 68 Social Emotional Learning Curriculum Implementation um, is ongoing along with the, as part of the middle school redesign. AVID school-wide for secondary and moving demonstration site status, um, uh, moving toward demonstration site status at both buildings. The grade six literacy implementations of being a reader worked, was worked on over the summer. We did K-8 Fast Bridge assessment implementation um, through remote assessments this fall. We have the advanced learning and STEM instruction for coding through the Universal Plus Grant and K-8 Pathways implementation through the arts continues through this year. So um, it's been a lot of uh, things that are going on in the CESA department, uh, but uh, we feel as though we are supporting our teachers as they are moving forward and delivering instruction to our students. And now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Director Stephanie White. Thank you, Alina. Um, good evening, Chair Alt, uh, directors, and Superintendent Battle. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, to tell you um, what our special education services look like um, under all those amazing offerings that Amina uh, just highlighted. Um, through the work that the CESA department is doing, um, we really have become a strong triangle. Um, uh, Director Gordon in technology, um, Director Oftedal in uh, curriculum instruction, and then the special education department really are um, collaborating at a level that um, we've never done before. And we believe that through this alignment and collaboration together, we are, we are providing uh, the very best services we can for all students. Um, as we're thinking about special education students, the two overarching principles that we are considering as we're deba debating on what um, model is best for each individual student is the ability to follow health and safety and um, the ability to access and engage in distance learning. We want our, our students to have the most access to the marvelous offerings that we have in our district. And so those are the two beginning um, lenses from which we look at. Um, Dr. Battle highlighted this, that we have created contingency learning plans uh, for all of our special education students, if they're in virtual academy or in person, which helps us flex between whatever model um, they choose or whatever model we happen to be in um, to maximize the learning um, and, the, and the general education curriculum. Our priorities, again, are health and safety, the relationships with our students, and we're so thankful to have all this time in person um, with our students and, and continuing to grow our relationships virtually with the students there. Um, and then, of course, um, our educational and social emotional needs um, of the students receiving special ed services. Uh, special ed is notorious for being flexible in the first place, and we continue to um, hone our skills um, in these models as well. Um, again, our, our top priority is to give all students access to these um, amazing offerings and opportunities. And so the work that we do is always thinking about how we can provide access through accommodations, modifications, and of course, specialized instruction. Um, one of the things that's really different this year is um, some of our individual service providers, our occupational therapists, our speech therapists, um, we now have a physical therapist that's on our staff um, providing their services virtually and um, using what they call telehealth. So a live teacher or um, therapy provider uh, and then a student as well. And we're practicing this even in our preschool classrooms um, so that they can um, be prepared if we do um, end up going to distance learning. Um, we have around 515 students in our distance learning school, um, a virtual academy. Um, they're um, learning at specific times in a synchronous or live meeting. Special ed teachers provide specialized instruction live. Sessions um, could be individual 
or they could be in small groups. And again, speech, occupational therapy, and physical therapy provide that teletherapy model. Services um, that were previously face to face have now moved virtual. And of course, that's all for health and safety. In our hybrid model, we have around 800 students, and these numbers are really reflecting K-12. Um, and they do um, two days a week and three days a week um, at home. The majority of our resource students are assigned to those two um, days, just like all students, and then three days synchronous. The special ed services are adjusted to meet the specific needs of each um, individual student, and that goes back to those contingency learning plans. There's likely not one plan that looks the same. Uh, students, um, we also have students who um, traditionally would have most of their day in a special ed setting, and we have offered those students four days a week. So they come Monday, Tuesday, they're home, um, like all students practicing their distance learning skills, and then back with us on Thursday, Friday. Um, I can't tell you how amazing the services are that our teachers are providing in these settings. These are the kiddos that we really um, work closely with. Um, both in instruction, but physically, um, helping them do all, all kinds of tasks and skills. And our teachers um, have been amazing in adapting um, the services they're providing um, to make sure that the students are safe and that they remain safe. Thank you, Stephanie and Amina. And that concludes our report, Chair Alt. Great. Thank you very much. Always, always an in-depth and informative report. Um, board members, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Anyone? Uh, Director Miller. Yes, thank you um, everyone for that. That's uh, very interesting and informative. I appreciate it. Um, and it was uh, full of facts and uh, statistics, which is excellent. I'll add a little personal touch to it. I'll say that uh, my middle schooler, uh, who you know uh, thrives in a in a structured environment, has really uh, enjoyed and, and made advantage of this uh, change uh, versus what happened in the spring. So it's been effective for him. Um, my fourth grader uh, is plodding right along and enjoying her classes and the, the high touch she's getting in her hybrid model. <laughs> and my kindergartner. The second day he had been there, I went to pick him up. So the next day was going to be Wednesday. He was going to be home and walking back to the car. And he said, Dad, I have a Zoom call at 10 o'clock tomorrow and a Zoom call at 1 o'clock. I know how to turn on my computer and get into it. And I thought, geez, you have more Zoom calls than I have tomorrow. So, <laughs> so it was fantastic. So it's, you guys are doing a great job. I appreciate it. I do have a question um, for uh, uh, potentially not for you two, uh, for Dr. Battle uh, or Steve Sobein, but uh, we have. Um, to this before asked this before I would like to eventually see uh, something about how we're doing for class size for the virtual academy it continues to be a concern um, I'm not sure maybe it's been resolved and solved I haven't heard anything in recent times but I know early on we had some struggles in getting matched up I, I understand the reasonings behind that but we do need to get to a, a completion point where um, where we're at a class size that's more in alignment with, with what this board expects in our district um, so I'd appreciate getting some information in the future about that, uh, and uh, not just an average, but a, but you know a breakdown, so I can make sure that there's not some pretty bad outliers out there that uh, and then I can counter any rumors I hear. So that's my uh, takeaway or question for at least for the future. Unless you have, I'm assuming you don't have immediate data in front of you, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Miller. I do have a brief response, and we can definitely get some more detailed information for you. Uh, Director Oftedal mentioned that they provided training for three new teachers last week. Actually, I believe the three were for the virtual academy, four for the virtual academy. Um, so I'll let Stacy provide some more details. So we should have some uh, more regular class size. I, we had a new teachers start on Monday and we reassigned on Monday at the elementary level. All of our class sizes, the, the averages are lower than our max. So we're 
the elementary is in really good shape. Secondary, um, we may have different hotspots, different classes that are around 40 students, maybe a little bit over 40 students. Um, and again, we talked earlier that we're looking at about 10% class sizes, 10% larger than what our in-person class sizes would be. And that we're, we're still in line with, with that as well in most places. So um, I, I can provide you more information, especially with the elementary, but uh, um, we're, we're in alignment with where we should be in most places. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, Director Chester. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question, well, it, well, it's a question and a statement. So, um, and it's probably for Stephanie. Um, so, Care 11 um, a week ago aired a um, an investigative um, information about. Um, <clears throat> families with um, kids with IEPs or with higher needs or special ed um, and um, the needs where it's conflicting with their in-home supports because there's an expectation for districts to be providing that education, you know, the educational services, but oftentimes there's other components of um, just life skills that happen in the instructional setting in a school environment. But if school's not in session and they're at home, their um, DHS is not um, is conflicting with wanting to provide in home support services while there's in school instruction. And so I was wondering how our district is addressing um, some of that with a lot of families who may have in home supports now being not being able to access them during distance learning time. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for the question. The, I mean, we really are in an unprecedented time with that because with our students with disabilities, we would always put the needs of the, of the student first and we have to think of their health and safety and the health and safety of others um, first during the pandemic. And so that puts us in some precarious, difficult um, situations. Um, what we've found and what's been working for us is um, the amazing relationships that our teachers and staff have with families out there to make those decisions as a collaborative team and to make sure that those student needs are, are um, met. And we are having lots and lots of collaborative IEP meetings, individual education plan meetings in order to solve the barriers that families are experiencing and that our school staff is experiencing. Um, they're, they're difficult decisions. And under the conditions that we're in right now, we are not allowed to go in the home. And so that does, um, create um, difficulties for families and for students. And we wanna really partner with them as much as we can. Um, some of the things that we've done um, is gone out to meet with families um, outside. Um, we can't go in the home, but we've been in the driveways, we've been in the front yards, and we've had lots and lots of Zoom meetings. Um, we have material deliveries that are happening, um, lots of consultations. Um, with outside um, agencies that are working with families. We're working more and more with our counties to make sure that if there are other community resources that can support the family during this time, um, while we are all having to prioritize health and safety, um, we're doing that as well. And so um, that, and we're determined to, um, to get to the solution that fits the team. And so that's, that's our recipe today. And so far, I think it's working and, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Uh, Director Schatz. Thank you. Um, so thanks to um, Superintendent Battle and um, the staff for the continued great work to um, address the needs of our students and families during this uh, rather tricky time um, in education. So I appreciate that very much. Um, clearly you're working as a team and that reflects what we do here in this district. We work as a team for the betterment of our students. So thank you for that. My question is about um, maybe for Amina, but perhaps for all of you um, is what opportunities students and families have to provide feedback on how the distance and hybrid learning is going, you know, not just for the virtual academy students, but also for the 
hybrid students that are working virtually when they're in the classroom we can kind of see you know how things are going for them you know but what opportunity do we have for um, for those students and families to provide feedback on their experience probably especially for virtual academies since we don't see them in the classroom um, ever so um, thank you for the question I mean I'll lead off with our discussion we had at, at uh, executive leadership team we did talk about how can we survey to get feedback about the opening of school and so I'll let uh, staff fill in uh, some more information about how we think we're going to approach it. Go ahead, Amina. Sure. I just wanted to say that um, uh, parent teacher conferences come to us at the end of October, and that is one of our prime opportunities to collect information from families um, about the start of the school year, as well as goals and progress for their students. So we will be utilizing uh, the time when we are meeting with parents and uh, providing uh, an opportunity for survey at that time. Okay, thank you, and Cheryl. Sorry, I had a little bit of a follow up. Then, so, um, so is that the so other than okay? So that's the end of October, and so how are what are parent teacher conferences going to look like this year? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, I, I mean, there's and that's you know, I, I I absolutely that is an absolutely terrific time to provide feedback. Um, um, from to, and receive feedback um, from parents and students if they if they are present. Um, if thinking about my students and me as a parent, um, I can certainly I can certainly contact my teacher. I can certainly you know who may or may not you know you know who can kind of address the you know some of the issues. Certainly um, you know the principal and things like that. Um, but the the opportunity to that's sometimes a lot more about academics than it is kind of about how it's working you know as a whole like does my child is that assumes a lot of um, kind of ability of the student and the and the family to understand how a student learns and if they're struggling they may think it's the subject matter or something so how are we really able to kind of get at what the root of might be that my child struggles to learn in this way and we didn't we don't really know that's a, that's a fact. So parent-teacher conferences uh, will be held virtually. Um, we are not bringing families into the buildings in, in numbers and having them, you know, moving in and out of the buildings. So they will be scheduled virtually. Um, and I just wanted to be clear, it's an opportunity at each of those conferences to also not only talk about the academic growth of the individual student, but to also deliver the invitation to complete the survey about the process overall and about the starting of school. Um, and then have some, so that those two things are separate. We just take that opportunity because we are talking with the parent face-to-face -to, -face to say, here, please complete the survey for us. Um, so that's one of the ways that we can separate that out. Um, and we continue to work with families, um, principals and uh, support staff in the buildings continue to work with families uh, for students who um, are not being successful with whatever structures are in place and really digging down into what are the root causes of those and what are the things that we can do as a district to adapt, adjust and uh, um, eliminate barriers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I was not clear that 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 there was a survey and the parent teacher conference. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, chair. Uh, additionally, Aaron um, Tinklenberg and I, in our planning for the launch of the school year, we held Zoom meetings with parents as well as students, um, and so we also plan to uh, replicate that again, as well as making sure that we have our cultural liaisons. Um, get some feedback um, from the parents they work with. Um, so yes, we'll also get some student um, feedback also. Director Shouts. Great, thank you. I actually have a, um, a double question. Um, just, just for clarity, the survey that parents will be in, invited to take um, during conferences, that will be sent out separately to everybody yeah. Okay. So it's not simply those people that attend conferences who will get the survey. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, board members, any other questions or comments? 
No? Um, I have a couple. Um, just a comment, just really appreciating um, all the additional um, information that you provided about the rigor um, that we're really focused on, um, both in person and virtually, particularly the curriculum review um, at the high school, and um, you know, really making sure that many perspectives are um, being included in the work that um, that the students are are doing, um, and also the um, kind of the re-examining re of win time, so what I need time for elementary students and making sure that both the English learners and um, special ed kids beyond core are um, really getting what they need and, and the supports that they need. So I, I thank you, I really appreciated that. Um, I guess my question, I have two questions. Um, one is, uh, we. Uh, I just want to make sure, I mean, I understood your um, your comment about the AVID demonstration schools. We still have one middle school that's still a, a demonstration school. We just want to get the second one to that status. Right. And um, District Director uh, Becker has um, is just really pleased with uh, the progress that uh, has been made at Eagle Ridge since Nicollet already is a demonstration school. Um, but uh, um, the external views and um, reviews from uh, AVID leadership uh, externally have been very, very positive as Eagle Ridge makes progress in that direction. Great, thank you. Uh, and then um, kind of a technology and access question. Um, how are we doing with 100% access for students and families to, um, to be able to get into the, the virtual learning? Hi, Rachel, that's probably a question for you. Hello, good evening. Um, yeah, it's it's an ongoing process, definitely. We have, at this point, we are caught up with all of the hotspot requests that we have had coming in. And I just wanna kind of uh, say thank you to the, the hard work that our social workers and our cultural liaisons, our associate principals and our principals, um, and down to individual teachers that have been working with individual students to um, find out what situations are happening where they may not be connecting into class. And then if it is an access issue for tech, for um, uh, internet, that we are able to solve that. So at this point, we do have an inventory of hotspots still, so we can, we can meet the needs immediately. Um, it's been a really interesting process because as Amina was talking about, um, one of those things that has really been wonderful has been that 120 minutes of synchronous learning um, that we are um, providing our students, which has been a foundational piece um, that has provided some success here in the last um, few weeks, is that that actually is a, is a quite taxing thing on the internet system. So families that have internet in their home, um, there are some variations that we're working through to help, um, help them. So even today, uh, we were working with a student at one of our schools um, and their family to provide ethernet cables to hook up directly to their modem for a faster experience for that student. Um, and so I feel really um, proud of the fact that we're at the individual student level now in solving those problems. And so um, it's been a lot of work. We've handed out a lot of uh, hotspots and a lot of um, support, but um, it's, it's definitely been one of the things that's been really um, fulfilling this last few weeks. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, just just a curious question uh, again, Rachel, for you. Are we aware of any areas in the district where there are just um, dead zones in terms of access and what the hotspots are able to, to support? Um, we haven't found any, luckily because of our suburban um, you know, geographic location, we don't have a lot of dead zones. We, we were finding that we were having some of our hotspots having problems um, because they had not been updated to the unlimited plan. And we have now uh, remedied that. So those are now moving. So um, we haven't seen anything. Um, however, in anticipation that we might have a few areas that we're not able to solve um, using our current T-Mobile um, hotspots, we are getting some hotspots in on a different network as well. So we have we would only have a few of those and we would only need those if, if absolutely needed in, a, in an area. Awesome, thank you. Uh, well, this I this report is always, as I said, you know, and as other board members have alluded to, it's 
always very informative and really gives us um, a lot a lot more um, you know greater understanding of, of what you all are doing and everything that's going on in our schools even though you know we personally may not witness it so um, thank you again for, for a great report uh, next oh, we're, um, staying with COVID we'll be receiving a report from Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services, um, about COVID funding updates. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you and good evening, Chair Alt, Board Directors and Superintendent Battle and those listening. Um, as we begin tonight, we want to cover a bit of information regarding our funding that we have received through state and federal means. So at this point, I'd like to share my screen if that's okay. Hang on. That is not working like I want it to. Lisa, we were seeing it initially. We, okay, so are you seeing? Yes. Okay, are you seeing the presentation? Yes. Oh, perfect, perfect. I thought you were seeing a different part of my screen. So great. Thank you so much for um, taking time this evening to hear about the information related to our funding. As we take a look at this, um, this is funding that was um, notified to us. Somewhat, I mean, we knew of the CARES funding as we get into this, but some of this came to us fairly recently. So as we take a look at this agenda, we will review the federal and state COVID-19 funding um, and some other funding, the purpose and allocation for each of those different sources, um, our 191 proposed use of funds for how are we planning to use them, county funding and our coronavirus relief funding um, with some next steps indicated as well as this is going to be an ongoing process for a while. Okay, so as we start, there's lots and lots <laughs> of acronyms. Um, that's typical in my world, but um, this has really been um, just a step up in the volume of acronyms we're dealing with. So this, this screen will help us to kind of know as we go through the rest of the presentation what some of these words mean. When we talk about CARES, we're talking about the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security. Um, a part of the CARES is broken down into two pieces. One is ESSER, which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. And the other part of it is the GEAR, which is the CARES Governor's Emergency Education Relief. So CARES, ESSER, and GEAR are all kind of one in the same package, but they are, um, they're, they're referred to for different reasons, okay? And they have different purposes as we'll talk about. Then we have our, our CARES funding that the Dakota County received and that we've made a request to um, see if they would have a portion allocated to us. And then there's the CARES funding that Scott County received that there too, they have allocated a portion to us as a member of their county and as um, for the students that reside within Scott County. Then we have our CRF allocation, which is the coronavirus relief funds. So this is more recent and the CRF funding um, is a very limited period of time. It basically starts from July 1st and goes only through December 30th. So it's a much shorter period of time. We'll get into that in a moment. And then we have our Dakota Electric Grant. So when we take a look at just the table that kind of compares them, that's what you're seeing here now in front of you. Um, the CARES ESSER funds is the first column of numbers that you see. And so you can tell that there's a 90% and a 9.5% amount. And they, they are being handled differently and treated differently as there was some pending um, law change that was being requested. So we know that together that's, a, that's about a $1.5 million there. And then you have your GEARS funds. The GEAR funds are intended um, or to be a, the amount of 295665 
Our CRF is the last column to the right, and that is a $2.7 million that you see listed there. The dates that these are effective all are, um, they, they do vary. The CARES funds run from March when this all began with the COVID um, through September of 22, 2022. So these funds, these 1.5 million are intended to be able to be used all the way through September of 2022. Um, that's true of the GEAR as well. The CARES funds, as I mentioned, that's a much shorter and smaller time period that we're talking about. We have yet to submit our final application and budget for the CARES, but we will be doing that. We're going to be utilizing some for the past school year. So um, that 339,000 you see at the bottom on the left is for fiscal year 20, which is the year we're closing out and auditing. And so as a result, then we'll have an application for fiscal year 20 for CARES, and we'll have an application for fiscal year 21. And assuming there's still some funds remaining, we would then utilize that in fiscal year 22 with a separate and distinct um, application for 22. Um, the GEAR funds, we anticipate, we have not yet submitted that, but we know where they're going towards as um, you'll hear a little later the detail of. And so we know for fiscal year 20, we're not going to be utilizing the GEARS funds in that year. We are instead going to use them in FY21. And I anticipate those will be fully used as you'll see in a moment. The CRF funds, um, that's solely for the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. And so um, we'll move on to the next slide, which talks a little more about that CARES ESSER funds. So when we talk about last school year and our audited numbers that we're looking at, we're working on those audit entries now, and we're anticipating around 339,000 to be spent there. Uh, the general fund will show 196,729 being spent. Um, in areas of hourly wages for planning, for PPE, and I, that does stand for personal protective equipment. Um, it seems a very common phrase anymore, but um, just to clarify what that is. For supplies and uh, technology. On $96,710 will be spent on our transportation delivery routes that we did last spring. For community service, there is $142,436 for childcare hourly wages that uh, were identified as being solely due to that COVID time period. And so for fiscal year 20, there, that amount will be um, coded to the CARES ESSER funds. Um, the remaining funds for CARES ESSER will happen in fiscal year 21, and hopefully there will still be some as well still available for fiscal year 2022 if needed. So we talk about gear, as I mentioned, we're not doing any for last fiscal year because all of our extra Chromebooks that we purchased came in after July 1st. As the spring, we really made use of what we had available in our um, you know, storage and other needs that we, um, we may have been holding those machines for in the classrooms. We, we sent them all out to everybody. And so we made that happen for last spring and we did not purchase anything at that last minute because Frankly, there was, a, there was also an issue of being able to receive them in time. So our order actually was received after July 1st, and we are now in a position where we are one-to-one um, -one ratio at this time. Um, the total cost of that purchase that was related to the Chromebooks necessary was 420,000. You can see that's a larger amount than the gear funds that are available. So we'll code 295,665 towards gear, and then the remaining amount of that cost of Chromebooks we would um, consider as part of our CR fund, CRF allocation. And I'll talk in a moment as to why I say it in the way I did. Um, there may be another means to cover those funds and we'll talk about that. For our CARES Dakota County, um, in early September, uh, we did share with Dakota County our enrollment numbers and specifically those numbers of students that we know to be residing within Dakota County similar to what we had done for Scott, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the group of Dakota County superintendents also met prior to September, and they, they discussed how would we utilize and what is our need um, when it comes to something that is a shared need for the county as well as the school district. And that's where it was determined that childcare and internet connectivity are the two main things that are most problematic for our families. And so with that in mind, um, we asked for a an allocation to be determined for each school district within Dakota County through the funds that they had received through CARES. 
our total request as a group of Dakota County superintendent school districts, superintendents and their school districts um, is 8,333,477. And then as we take a look at what was our specific request, $585,650 was intended for child care reimbursement for the period of March through November and technology connectivity is $35,280. We are still awaiting a determination from Dakota County as to how and if there will be an allocation of funds through their CARES funds. For Scott County in September of 2020, we, we, we were notified that $51,094 would be allocated to our school district. So we have already identified the costs there related to child care, um, in the period of March 1st through November 30th is what um, their allocation allows us to spend it during that period of time. So those, those expenses have been identified and um, they're basically at the same sites that are located in serving our, our families that are in the Scott County area. So this works well. Um, the expenditures, uh, we just need to show them a proof of evidence of that and uh, in the required format. So we'll be doing that in October. Then lastly, I wanna talk a little bit about our CR funds, um, our coronavirus relief funds. This allocation is $2.7 million. Uh, September 26th is when we had received approval from MDE of our proposed allocation application and we had submitted a budget as well. Now we can work on that budget with MDE as far as adjustments that may be required, but what that meant to produce um, the necessary documents to that point was a, a review of all of our expenditures thus far, and then an estimate of, estimate of what it is that we would anticipate before uh, the end of December. The challenge for us is we need to make sure that not only do we incur the cost, but we also report them and receive the funds reimbursed back down through the system all by December 30th, um, because it's a little different than in past where you have time to make that paperwork and stuff happen. You gotta have it all done by the end of the end of December for us to be able to receive the funds. Two projects were identified that did require pre-approval of even submitting the application. So we did do that. Those two projects will address a, another layer of protection to our, uh, which would include ventilation filters within our HVAC systems across all our schools. And a second project uh, was identified to address our front office and our health office protections for employees in these spaces. Um, as I mentioned, the funds needed to be, need to be com, um, used and everything completed by December 30th. Our budget that we submitted is laid out in this format so you can see kind of how we're planning to spend those funds. Uh, the challenge for us is just sometimes you you estimate a certain amount for salaries or wages and, and it might change. So we want to be flexible that way and be monitoring that on a regular basis so we can ensure that we're fully utilizing this. As I mentioned earlier about the technology piece, um, for the amount that is necessary, the, the dollars that we've identified for those Chromebooks is clearly eligible under the CR funding. But if we have expenditures in other areas that actually um, make better sense to utilize the CR funds, we will do so. As we know, we also still do have um, some other possibilities for funding of those Chromebooks if necessary, but um, they're, they're clearly eligible. We're just needing that flexibility of being able to, is it technology or is it salaries and wages, depending upon how those estimates come through to actual. All right, Dakota County, or sorry, Dakota Electric Grant. We received a grant from Dakota Electric $25,000 has been received for the use of bringing our internet connectivity. This will fund 100 families during our 2020-2021 school year. Um, so that, that's very helpful to us. And then additionally, they, they, they added in an extra $2,500 as a bonus and that we have received towards our COVID-19 costs incurred in delivering food to our community families. So we really appreciate that, that generosity. For our fiscal year 2019-2020, as the audit is still in process, the final impact to the fund balance is going to be in our report to the school board in the audited data on November 12th. And I will say though that we are anticipating the actual results are improved from the budgeted projections. So uh, we'll share more about that at, in November. 
Our assumptions for this school year of 2020, 2021 and beyond, this is something that is going to be with us for a while as we anticipate that the impact to, um, of COVID-19 on our finances will probably go through 2023 fiscal year. Um, for example, unemployment costs that we're incurring now, they become an adjustment two years down the line on the levy. And so um, when you incur expenses higher than what was estimated two years ago, then um, those actual expenditures, they, um, they result in an adjustment then later down the road. Um, so at this time, we have not heard of any proration to our current year fiscal year funding. Uh, there is concern that possibly some of our funding formulas might be adjusted down. Um, we haven't heard that for certain yet either for the current year. There are lots of upcoming um, conferences and sessions that are related to uh, COVID and CARES funding and even our CR funds, for example, we learned of one just today that's being held next week. So these are these are topics that are constantly changing and we're just wanting to stay um, stay in tune and, and make sure that we're accomplishing not only the necessary deadlines that need to be met, but also making sure that we're maximizing the use of these funds as best possible. Uh, for, the, for the future, for fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 23, at this moment, we would anticipate utilizing 0% increase on the funding formulas, um, not knowing exactly what the impact is going to be at a state level and how that's going to flow down through um, on the legislation. So that is the plan at this time. For next steps, um, we're wrapping up those journal entries for last year. We're monitoring our current year budget and actual expenses as they relate to the CRF allocation. And we'll be completing those necessary steps for the ESSER and GEAR applications and budgets. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, board members, I will open it up for questions, comments. Uh, Director Hume. Yeah, I just, can you hear me? Yes. I was curious to learn a little bit more, I think it was slide 11, about the HVAC ventilation improvements and employee protections that are like what what are some examples of that i guess is what i'm curious about somehow i knew that would be a question so i have up on my <laughs> screen the email that we had sent um so i wanted to have it up because this gets a little technical um but what we found is that we we know that our ventilation system that we have is up to par and it meets all the requirements um, what we did, though, is we did take a look and in, brought in a consultant just to kind of take a look at things and help us to define what it is that we could do as another layer of protection. And we found that um, if we were focused on the main offices and our health offices, we would be looking at um, what it is that we can do to improve that air quality. And as a result, the, there's some research and the, the upgrades that are recommended is a needle point bipolar ionization, which reduces the viruses, spores, and bacteria in the air. So it's a special filter process that's placed within our, actually within our vents in our HVAC system. And it does that then. It ionizes the air and further um, eliminates and reduces those viruses, spores, and bacteria. So that is the um, project that you see listed there in the first, first bullet. The and second is there a bullet, that one? Sorry. Everything has to be completed by December. So yes, that very is very soon. Got it. Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're trying to do it at all of our sites. And so that's they're they're hard at it. You know, there's the planning of the project, there's getting all the equipment ordered and then installed. Sure. And then the second bullet is regarding our front office and health areas. And it's pretty much the um, um, kind of plastic barriers that you see and, and finding a way to make that a little bit more um, permanent. In those in those settings. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Director Schatz, I believe you were next. Thank you, um, thank you, Lisa. I um, I know this is a lot of work in a really tight time frame to take um, to find and take advantage of these funds, which are 
um, outside of you know what we're used to for funding opportunities. So I appreciate you um, and your diligence in finding them and um, working through what those um, what the funding is and the, the requirements. And I um, I didn't know that we had a kind of a Dakota County consortium for um, deciding what that the that child care and um, access were kind of the priorities, but you know that makes that makes perfect sense. I mean, those are the certainly the two areas that go across um, across school districts um, and the needs that we have. So that's um, that's a really nice um, shows really nice cooperation I think between our districts um, in Dakota County. So my um, I just want a clarification on slide four or page four where it talks about the funding updates it has esther and gear are yet to be submitted and so everything else this is march 20 through september 2022 so we these are the two areas that are not don't are not done are not due in, in december everything else is is that right these are the longer term projects yeah, actually, due, the due date for um, these applications for the current fiscal year is March. Um, okay. So it's a very unique situation. Um, however, these applications, we have the application all ready to go. It's just fine tuning it. We're wanting to make it as close to possible as to the audited numbers so that there's absolutely no, no adjustments to the pre previous year. So it's just okay. a matter of getting that finalized and then um, submitting it. Okay, and then these are the two as you described here and is listed here and the purpose are much broader than the kind of, I guess the local grants or the, um, as the county grants are, um, but they have a much more expansive scope of funding than the other ones. Exactly, and that's where we're, we're really taking a look at the cost that we've incurred and identifying you know, where's the best fit for this to make sure that we are um, maximizing the use of the funds available to us. And then, so for the ESSER, then this has a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, what, 10 items here. Is this yes. some, um, some money will go to each of them. We have, we have some, somehow calculated what, what that money, how that money is allocated between each of those 10 items. It's kind of a lot of items to fund. Yeah, these, this is, these are items that are taken straight from the application information and allows for us to use any or all. So we may not choose to use all of those different items, but this is the breadth of what that those funds are able to be utilized for. Okay, and we don't have to state that in the application, what we're gonna specifically use them for? When we, when we submit that application, we need to be particular about the, essentially we're marking all of those areas simply because um, as we go through, there might be some hourly wages related to this or to that. And so we ended up, as we went through the application and, and preparing it, we're marking them all. Because the other thing about this is, as we move into 21, um, we also include our non-publics as well. And so they may they may choose an area that we didn't, for example. So we wanna make sure that it's all inclusive. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna sum, assigning some dollar amount estimated dollar amount to each one of these areas um, and is there flexibility and but there's flexibility in what that ultimate number turns out to be is yes that, okay. yes yes okay. so this is like the broad list of you know this is where you could spend it and take your pick of where you where you're finding it most needed and then there's the um budget application you submit to say here's how we're going to plan to spend it in this fiscal year and the dollar amounts we anticipate and then as we move through the year, we can adjust that so that it more accurately reflects what our actuals are. And then when we submit our actuals, it's just like our federal grants that we do, and they reimburse based only on our actual expenses. Okay, perfect. That helps very much. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Director Schatz. Uh, Director Courier. Oh, dear. Thank you. Um, Lisa, I just want to express my gratitude for the page where you took all those abbreviations <laughs> and gave us the codes and the and the sometimes we don't do that and I, I don't and as much as I've been in education all of these years I printed this page off mm -hmm. so as I went through and and read your uh, report I 
I referred back to this to keep it straight. So thank you very You're much welcome. for mm -hmm. this page. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, I just have, I uh, just want to second the, the gratitude. I uh, really appreciate um, the education finance is not simple to begin with and COVID just adds another layer. And um, so being able to pull this information together and make it relatively easily digestible. Um, it's just just really great. Thank you. Um, I guess just I had just one clarification, mm -hmm. um, which you had already covered. And I just want to make sure I understand. So basically, in terms of like, we're very fortunate to have a tech levy. Yes. And where we can, what I'm hearing you saying is that where we can, we will try to direct the CARES funding that could be used for technology um, elsewhere um, so that we're maximizing the other areas that we might need to provide services and support and kind of use our tech levy specifically for technology rather than using the CARES funding for technology when we already have a way to pay for it. Right, because your technology levy um, that we receive on an annual basis, that is available as a restricted fund, right? So as we've talked about, our goal is to utilize those restricted funds first before we do general funds. So we have expenditures that are necessary for COVID that are otherwise gonna use general unassigned fund balances. Uh, we'll use the CRF funds first, right? And um, yet if now I'm down to a point where, okay, I've got those all addressed and I don't have any other needs then, then I can look at, you know, what's the next layer. And so technology is that next one we go to, because we also know that we have plenty of technology needs. And if we need to, we will absolutely then make another order. But we know now that those orders are also months out. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Um, all right. Um, I think we will move on to the student representative report. Um, Nicole May, welcome. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, let me just pull up. Okay. Hello, board. For the past month and a half, students at BHS have been readjusting to hybrid in the virtual academy. Though it's been tricky at times with connection failures, it has been a relatively steady transition. An amazing subject that multiple caring teachers have brought into our virtual classroom is the discussion of race and racism. I've personally had many teachers assign assignments and lead inclusive discussions on the current events of racial profiling, systemic racism, and police brutality. My class was even lucky enough to have a discussion with Mrs. Baker on her and our experiences with racism. It's been such a great learning experience for many that weren't informed prior to the discussions. On the other hand, multiple students have voiced their concern about the load of work they receive. They feel overwhelmed with work, family life, college applications, ACT prep, and on top of all that, schoolwork. Our student body hopes that teachers will become more informed with our hectic lifestyles at this point in time and accommodate their workload with our current lifestyle. Thank you, and that is all for this report. Thank you very much, Nicole May. Uh, next, uh, we'll go to our superintendent report, Dr. Battle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair Alt and directors of the board. Tonight, I want to highlight a couple of partnerships that have already or will provide opportunities for students to find and pursue their pathways. The first is a grant through the Minnesota Department of Education for $80,000 that will support our pathways model at elementary level by engaging students and supporting staff in the area of computer science. The funding which could be continued for two years, and uh, we may receive an additional 200,000, is especially intended to help identify students in underrepresented groups who have a talent and interest in computer science. The second partnership is the, with the Greater Twin Cities United Way, in which a pilot group of 15 Burnsville High School students participated and earn money in a four-week summer internship and sustainability program. 
the students receive relevant work exposure and experiences, which is a core tenant of the District 191 Pathways model at the high school level. As part of the experience, students identified their pathway interests, interviewed employees in that career field, developed a plan of action to accomplish their goals, published a video on the importance of workplace skill development, and also created a professional resume. They also completed online modules that helped them better understand workplace competencies like attitude, appearance, dependability, integrity, and persistence. Mentor teachers supported the students throughout the program. And at the end of the summer, students earned a certificate of completion that is included in their portfolio. Providing these experiences and removing barriers so all of our students can have them is a part of what it means for us as a Pathways District. So I want to thank the Department of Education and Greater Twin Cities United Way, all of our community partners, and I especially want to thank Kathy Funston, our Director of Partnerships and Pathways, for her work to develop and maintain those partnerships for the benefit of our students. So as you see, we are continuing with the launch and implementation of uh, Pre-K-12 Pathways. That concludes my report for tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Battle. Next, uh, we will go to board member reports. Any board member reports? Director Holliger. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Battle and members of the board, I am writing this to inform you of my intent to resign from my position on the board of ISD 191 effective at the close of this meeting. When I ran for the board back in 2018, I had two children in school full time. Now that I have two more little ones, both under 14 months and a much fuller plate, I feel that I can't properly devote the time and energy needed to be an effective member of this board. Because of this, I feel that it is in the best interest if I step down. I've had such a wonderful experience getting to work with all of you and to know you on a personal level. Thank you for everything you have done for me. I appreciate it more than you will ever know. Thank you, Jen. It's hard news to receive and we understand. Um, I'll make an exception um, given the unique nature of your report board members. Um, do you have any comments for Jen? I'll just say, Jen, you and I joined at the same time, and it's been a pleasure getting to know you. And I think I sent, texted you this. You'll you'll definitely be missed, and we'll, we'll miss you, and we wish you nothing but the best in the future. Director Schatz. Um, yeah, Jen, I think you um, had an amazing start um, to the to your tenure in the board. Um, you just came on running and really made a lot of valuable contributions. And um, we will miss the babies on Zoom. So yes, really. Thank you. Uh, Director Chester. Yes, Jen, just like Scott said, I think the three of us are all new together as board members. And um, I have valued getting the opportunity to know you a little bit better, um, get to see your two new children. Um, and um, more importantly, just your your voice and your activism on this board has been valuable, um, especially in the committees that you've represented and served and going through what I would have to say um, and what people have told me, this is a, a unique board experience for two for the two years that we've started as board members and that you've handled that. Um, through all of your growth um, personally <laughs> with your family um, very um, gracefully um, and appreciate um, everything that you have brought to serving our students. And I know you will continue to do so even though you will not be at all of these board meetings. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Director Courier. Yes, thank you, uh, Jan. Thank you for all of your work. 
thus far. But looking ahead, I hope you reconsider and join our board in the future um, because children do grow up and you have been such a great board member so far. And given this experience, uh, you can take this forward and build on it and return. And even with more experience and more wisdom and come back and contribute even more. So thank you for your service, but we're looking forward to you possibly coming back. So thank you and best wishes. Thank you, Dee Dee. Eric. Well, Jen, thank you so much for the time you put into this board. Um, you know, in any group of people, um, there are always people that are tend to be more uh, outgoing and, and verbal and outspoken and, and others that are a little bit more quiet and, and, and I don't think it's a surprise that you typically have fallen into that latter part from often, but um, I got to tell you, there's a number of evenings I uh, leaving, I went home and I thought, you know, Jen turned her mic on and said something that just, I had not even thought about. It was very insightful. It was, uh, it was right on spot. And I, I was always amazed with the input you had that you brought to the table. So thank you very much. Um, the hardest part about service and volunteering and, and, and helping out your community is, um, it can become overwhelming. And I totally understand that. And the best thing you can do for yourself is, and you know, is to know when it's time to say no and step back and take care of yourself and your family. So I think you're making the right decision. Thank you very much for your time and service to this board and this community. Thank you, Eric. Teresa, did you want it? Did you have anything you wanted to say? Yes, thank you, Chair All. So first I want to thank you for your service and your faith in me. Um, to select me as superintendent. Um, first and foremost, you prioritize uh, children. And uh, because your children are part of this community, I was especially moved uh, that you put that faith in me. And so I wanna thank you for your wise, stable uh, counsel. Um, I also want to thank you for seeing me and knowing I had a different lived experience when shortly after the killing of George Floyd, we had a, a meeting and the first thing you wanted to know was, how are you? Um, because when he called out for his mother, you and I both were very touched by that in a different way. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and I'll, I'll miss you and I hope you know, uh, you're a member of this community. So just thank you. Thank you all. Um, I did, um, with help, prepare a brief statement. Um, Jen, I just want to give you my personal thanks for your service to this board, to the district, and to the 191 community. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and to work with you over the past two years. As others have already mentioned, I don't think you could have picked a more important and more demanding time to serve in this in this role. We've had laughter and we've had tears. Uh, facing the kind of challenges many boards may not see over decades or more, I know all of us have appreciated your thoughtful questions and insights, your positive attitude, and your collaborative approach as we navigated those challenges together. This board has made difficult decisions and we did a better job because you were here with us. So thank you for your service um, and please keep in touch. You are still here, we're still all here and uh, coffee shops are open. <laughs> so thank you. All right, were there any other board member reports? Nope, okay. Oh. I almost forgot, I'm sorry. It's remote and I wanted to present to you on behalf of the board, <laughs> with a little, a bell. Um, we can figure out how to get that to you. Um, there is an inscription on the base um, honoring your, your, your years served here and um, it's inscribed with your name. So 
thank you again. All right, on to the business meeting. Uh, starting with the consent agenda, although board action is required, it is generally unnecessary to hold discussion on these items. In the event a board member wishes to discuss an item, that item will be moved for separate consideration. Uh, are, is there anything that board members would like to um, move for separation? Seeing none, uh, I will take a motion. So moved. Moved by Director Chester, second? Second. Seconded by Director Courier. Um, Ms. Kenny, would you please call the roll? Chester? Aye. Courier? Aye. Holwiger? Aye. Hume? Aye. Miller? Aye. Schatz? Aye. Alt? Aye. And the motion carries. Uh, next on to new business, we will be starting um, taking action on uh, awarding the sale of refunding bonds with uh, Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services, and Jeff Seely with Ellers. Welcome Thank you. Down. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. I'll start off, Jeff, um, with just a, a little intro to um, the fact that we sold bonds today that Jeff is going to give us information around. And so there, I just want to make sure that all board members are aware that there is a sale day report that was added this afternoon to the board book. So you should have that available to you as well. And that's the data that Jeff will be covering. And then um, maybe after his report, then um, Charles, if you would like for me to read the recommendation, um, I could do that at that point. All right, so Jeff, I'll turn it over to you then so that you can provide us with the information we need to know about the sale of bonds today. Great, thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Um, as you know, uh, we sold bonds today um, for the refunding of your 2011A bonds. Those were issued back in 2011 uh, in the amount of 16575000 Those are alternative facility bonds. Uh, so we refinanced or refunded them today with the sale of these bonds, and we received four uh, bids on it. The winning bidder was BNY Mellon Capitals out of New York, and uh, the their bid had a true interest cost of 1.17%. So um, the high bid was 1.46%. Uh, so all four were very good bids, but uh, we're seeing incredible rates right now. Um, the lowest that we've probably ever seen. It's, it's just kind of crazy out there on tax exempt bonds right now. So uh, congratulations on the timing because that worked very well for you. So um, I gave you a pre-sale report. It's in your board packets. And uh, here's the bottom line. So the resulting uh, savings to the taxpayer um, is $2,242,000. Um, that represents a 14.1% net present value benefit. And it has been a long time since I've seen a 14.1% net present value benefit. That is extremely high. So to just kind of go through um, the report uh, quickly here, if you look at uh, the attachments, um, page one, you can see BYN Mellon is the winning bidder and the reoffering yield is actually the true interest rate that you're receiving on each one of those maturities. Each, each principal payment or maturity has its own um, interest rate. So 0.24% for next year's uh, principal payment, all the way up to 1.35%. Those are your true interest rates on those bonds. Uh, and again, each one has its own uh, interest rate. So you'll be saving money from 2022 through 2030. And of course that money is going directly back to the taxpayers. This is not money that's freed up for expanding they're spending on other types of expenditures. Instead, it is a direct 
uh, savings to the taxpayer. And it's almost $250,000 a year for each of those years. Uh, so other bidders, um, Hilltop of Dallas, Texas, Baird out of Milwaukee and Morgan Stanley out of New York. Those are the other bids that uh, rounded out the um, proposals. So taking a look at it, the next page, we're issuing $11,485,000 worth of bonds. Uh, the reoffering premium, the premium is uh, money, and I think we've talked about this before, money given to you up front. And the way it's generated, if, if you look back on the winning bid, you can see an interest rate of 4% and that drops to three and two but the reoffering yield is much lower. What, what happens is you're actually going to pay that higher coupon, but they give you money in order to do that. Why? Think of it from an investor standpoint. Um, it really isn't that attractive for me to invest or buy a bond that pays me 0.23%, right? So, the underwriter who buys it offers it to me as a retail buyer for 4% earnings. And now that's a good return in today's market. But in return, I don't pay just par, you know, face value for the bonds. I actually pay like a dollar five for it or 105%. So that extra 5% goes directly back to you to offset the difference between the actual interest rate you're paying and what the market interest rate is. So that million dollars, uh, 1,477,000 actually goes back towards savings for the taxpayers. So that's just a little bit about premium. Um, just hit a few other items here. You can see on the attachment page five, that is your new debt service. That's something that uh, uh, Lisa will be very interested in. You can see the principal and interest payments by uh, date there. And then, of course, the big news, there it is on page uh, six, about $250,000 a year savings for about two million, two and a quarter million dollars in savings. So you have a resolution and oh, and I also include the rating report for anyone who wants to read how your district was was rated. Um, I won't go through that, but um, it's the credit opinion from Moody's. Um, you have a resolution in front of you that resolution awards the sale to the winning bidder. So the recommendation before the board is that the Board of Education adopts the formal resolution awarding the sale of general obligation alternative facilities refunding bonds series 2020A in the original aggregate principal amount of 11,485,000, fixing their form and specifications, directing their execution and delivery, providing for their payment and providing for the redemption of bonds refunded. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I will take a motion to approve. A motion. Moved by Director Schatz. Second? Second. Second by Director Miller. Questions or comments? Well, I really appreciate that um, we're doing this again, that we're able to save our taxpayers um, to the tune of $250,000 annually. Um, just nice. Nice to have a little bit of good news like that. So thank you very much. Um, and Ms. Kenny, would you please call the roll? Courier? Aye. Paul Wager? Aye. Hume? Aye. Miller? Aye. Schatz? Aye. Alt? Aye. Chester? Aye. And the motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Yes, you too. And uh, that was our one new business item. So I will declare us adjourned uh, in light of uh, Director Howiger's uh, resignation. We are adjourning to a workshop for board planning.
um, and it will focus on um, an appointment to fill the vacancy. Um, Aaron, do we need a couple minutes pause between? We could just uh, pause for about one minute. 